Welcome back to By Any Means Necessary on Radio Sputnik in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Jackie Lukeman, sitting in for Sean Blackman. And as always, we're your guide to connecting the political, social and economic movement shaping the world around us. It's Friday, so it's time for another edition of our weekly segment, The Red Spin Report, where we discuss sports, politics, and struggle with Nate Wallace, co-host of The Red Spin Sports Podcast. Nate, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, Jackie, glad to be back. Absolutely glad to have you because, Nate, I watched the Malice at the Palace documentary the other night, and I remember this happened you know, happening 17 years ago. I watched it. I watched that game. Uh, I was a much bigger basketball fan then than I am now. And I knew there was more to that story than what was propagated by the media days after. But that documentary, I think, was explosive and really exposed the lengths to which, number one, fans and and owners believe that they own these players and have a right to do whatever they want because they bought a season ticket, but also the way the media is quick to demonize young black men in sports when they don't behave the way that they, you know, allegedly should. So I I, I don't know. I, I'm wondering what your perspective is on this documentary and the things that it exposed about sports culture in regard to black men, black athletes in particular. Yeah, I mean, one thing that struck me was like you just looking at the montage of like all the media reactions on the Talking Head Network, CNN, MSNBC down the line. You see a young Stephen A. Smith on MSNBC back in the day, but Aaron Brown on CNN. Honestly, I don't I forgot that guy was actually like a commentator with the show mind blowing to that guy actually was uh, on prime time for so long, but just calling everyone thugs, 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 thugs. And we, now that's kind of got a little stigma to it, right? BLM, a lot of activist movements have like made sure that, you know, paint that and in, in, as an epithet, uh, sort of like, cause we know what people are saying when they say that, um, that was just recycled. And what we really learned from the, from the documentary and I mean, I already knew, but it's like bringing it to a mass level. It's important because they edited the footage. What you saw on ESPN and, and the uh, what you saw even during the game, right, was not the whole story um, at all. Um, it didn't in, in order to craft that narrative that these are out of control players. Let's not forget Ron Artest is someone. If you go back and watch the 2019 documentary about him growing up in Queensbridge and and know his story, is someone who admittedly is like you know has mental health issues and kind of like issues with balancing himself and whatnot and. Um, you know, that's all devoid of that, of course, but like the way it was covered, it fits so much within this pattern of like, again, fans being the ones that are there spending so much money and therefore have a right to the kind of experience that they want to consume without any kind of interference from, you know, the, the players, from the entertainers. And, you know, it's like they're, they're objects instead of subjects in the minds of like the spectators. It's like there's a gaze on them. And an and idea that, again, the trope of like being grateful, right? The, the idea that, you know, you shut up, you know, even the NBA, when they you know, dropped the suspensions on these players, like Ron Artest for the whole season, Steven Jackson, 30 games, Jermaine O'Neal, 25, it's ultimately reduced. They, uh, it was very clear that, uh, you know, they were not allowed to talk about it at all. And then there was this you know, insane, you think of all the crimes that happened in this country, real crime, like, you know, with people like victims of sexual assault, you know, people that are, you know, actually, you know, the, the murders and, and all sorts of things like that that don't get as much attention from law enforcement in terms of actually, you know, sustained investigative work. But for some reason, this was top of the priority line in terms of all these resources. And I thought the prosecutor actually came out pretty well, but this, he was like, you know, wasn't really the biggest fan of it. And he took heat actually for, um, Look at say making a point. They're like, no, the fans need to be like held account the account of this uh, every bit as much, if not more, maybe. And he ruled that Jermaine O'Neal was acting in self defense to the uh, chagrin of that fan who was just literally walking out on the court with a closed fist, and then right. has the audacity to act as if like you know, oh, I, I, this is totally unfair. So yeah, it just none of that was brought up originally, right? And that's sort of what this documentary's done for us here, and uh, it's important. Yeah, I mean, it was wild because I think I remember like watching that game and and saying like, 
okay, I wouldn't have been, I, I would have said something to Ron Artest as, as a coach, like in the locker room for laying down on the scorer's table, right? But, right. but when the beer was thrown at him or on him, because let's be clear, the beer wasn't thrown at him. It, he was hit with it while uh-huh. he was laying down on the table, minding his business, you know, for, for whatever reason, it is true. You know, at the, at the time, it's, it, and it's wild, you know, Nate, that we, we have a better understanding of, of mental health challenges like depression and anxiety just 17 years later than we did then. It's, it's wild how, how fast consciousness and understanding uh, grows when people start advocating for themselves, which I think Ron Artest did with that uh-huh. documentary. But, you know, it was wild seeing in this documentary, Malice at the Palace, how the fan that threw the beer and the fan who came out on the court with his fist clenched uh-huh. to challenge Jermaine O'Neal. And that's the, that was the other thing. There were so many people involved in this that we didn't even know about because you saw so little of what really happened. But it was wild to see these two fans to this day believe that they didn't do anything wrong. And there are still people defending these fans because they have this, you know, emotional investment in these players. And I think that speaks to the commodification of these athletes where Players or fans and any, you know, folks who call themselves super fans and season ticket holders really believe that because they've spent money to see these folks play, they've spent money for these people to entertain them, they can treat them any way they want. And I think that has serious implications for the way we continue to look at professional sports today, Nate. No, it, it absolutely does. And I, mean, I think the thing that really is striking is the, the fan who threw the beer. He wasn't, I mean, the guy was even asked directly, do you feel badly that like, you know, Artes got the wrong guy essentially. And he's just kind of like laughing. Like, I just wish I had tripped him, you know, like, and, and the guy's sitting up there and he's like, yeah, the, the personification of that, like insane fanhood culture that is living vicariously through the Detroit Pistons successes and ups and downs, whatever. Now let's not forget the Pistons are defending NBA champions at this point. Uh, this was an extremely intense rivalry. I mean, this like this was the the matchup in the Eastern Conference Finals the year before, um, and the Pistons you know narrowly got the got the win in that series and went on to win the NBA Finals against the Lakers. Um, but so that's the backdrop of all this going on here, and so you have all this emotion that's been building up back and forth, you know, kind of jabs, like, you know, metaphorical jabs going back and forth, and in real intense drama between these two teams and the fans want to believe that they are as much a part of that as the actual players on the court, the coaches coaching the game, the support staff and all that. That is part of what that's the intoxicant of sports fandom, right? That's like that you can actually escape the day-to-day just drudgery of whatever your life is, or just maybe if your life isn't even (laughs) that bad, just that chance to um, have kind of like an out-of-body experience almost when you go to that game. And there's something about the crowd, right? And I, I even think back to things I've done at games where I, afterwards I look back and I'm like, God, I can't believe I got like so mad or fired up just like about what was going on in the moment. But when you're in the crowd, when you're in uh, the anonymity that comes with being in a large group of people um, that are all kind of like working in the same degree, you know, energy, have the same energy, pulling for the home team, whatever it may be, that – then you're able to project all that you hate, all that is bad, all that's wrong with the, in, in your anger in the world onto that opposing team. And it's like that that model is very profitable. It's very profitable. And it's sort of like um, and it draws a lot of people in. You're able to dehumanize the opponent very literally. Um, and uh, that, yeah, it is problematic. I mean, let, let's not be, let's not forget either real quick that David Stern in the NBA here. Uh, the way this was handled, because it was an on the court incident and not something off the court, David Stern had total czar like decision making ability on this thing. And there wasn't any sort of analysis of it. He didn't go into any detail. He just said the decision was one against zero, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Being he yeah. against nobody, right? And that's just the way it went down, you know? So. Um, yeah, it, it's it, it's wild that you also had the fans throwing the chairs. If you look at the situation with them going into the tunnel there, and you just see all the fans coming down and congregating around there, and it was like, that really struck me the imagery of it because you're like, 
you it's like it's like almost like you're looking at not even zoo animals or something like the way that like the optics of that were set up as if like they are just like mm -hmm. not even human beings in the minds of these fans at that point they weren't just like one guy throwing a beer or something it was like a almost like an organized effort to sit there and just drown them in like disgusting soda uh popcorn like it's almost like a modern day tar and tarring and feathering mm. sort of like let's make them you know and that that's sort of it struck me uh, visually seeing that yeah, I think that's a great point, and I think that's a great an, uh, analogy. And I'm glad you brought up David Stern because what he did was to issue a dress code as if the way these men dressed on the court was the reason that they were physically attacked by all of these fans, which, again, you know, speaks to the racism in the way that the league and the media responded. You know, I think this incident was when I started to dislike Bob Costas and definitely Stephen oh. A. Smith. <laughs> um, oh, I, I, I really I put him on, but Bob Costas was the worst. In oh, this. he was the absolute worst. But, you know, in the, in the last couple of minutes, one of the former players in the documentary made a great point where, you know, the, the sports media made all this big deal about the thug mentality in the NBA, making these obvious, you know, racial inferences. But nobody said anything about all the fights that happen all the time in hockey. Now, I don't know how you can miss that clear racial hypocrisy, but the entire sports media did it, Nate. And it still happens mm -hmm. today, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. The, you know, the, the, the response to that from mainstream sports people, like, well, hockey fighting is part of the game in hockey. Like, well, I mean, this says who, and like, that's like, you know, that's, that is that way because it's been allowed to develop that way for the longest time. I mean, you look back at like how the NBA still profited off of like the image from the eighties and nineties when the game was much more physical than it is now. And, you know, and it, you had the bad boy Pistons, you had a physical brand of basketball where you know, they marketed themselves on that. They like in a lot of ways that like, this is tough, you know, gritty basketball. That's like, uh, it draw drew a lot of fans in. That was the, the that was an era of the league's you know utmost popularity. You look at coming out Magic and Bird going to the right. Jordan Isaiah Thomas Jordan. So it, it's it's absolutely um, you know something that they've made a lot of money on and capitalized on. And the, not, the yeah the analogy to hockey is just it's that way because it's that way. And with regards last thing to the dress code, I mean that was put in purely because they wanted they were. Scared they were going to lose sponsors, lose advertising people. Look at the media reaction. And they thought that like, oh, well, we just make them all wear suits at the press conferences. No one can wear do-rags anymore. Mm. Let's go after the AIs of the world, right? And like, you know, mm -hmm. stigmatize that and play into it instead of pushing back. And it's just funny because we always hear how woke the NBA owners are in contrast to like the NFL. And I always kind of like just think that's a little overblown because it's like, yeah, I mean, it's not that hard to be – you know, a little less reactionary than NFL owners, but it's uh, certainly, I think, overstated and giving too much credit uh, to these NBA owners about how what a harmonious relationship they have, you know, as if like there's no labor strife. It's uh, that and the media frames it that way all the time. Yeah, absolutely true. I definitely encourage people to watch the Netflix documentary Malice at the Palace. It's amazing. But with that, we are out of time and we're at the end of the hour. And you were listening to By Any Means Necessary on Radio Sputnik in Washington, D.C. Want to thank Nate Wallace so much for joining us. I'm your host, Jackie Lukeman, sitting in for John Blackman. And as always, we're your guide to connecting the political, social and economic movement shaping the world around us. By any means necessary.